housing is, is a massive, massive, massive issue. You, you've got to focus, you've got to pick the area that you're interested in and really kind of drill down into that area. Uh, so for me, um, I'm based in the east of England. So just, you know, looking at one as aspect of housing, rogue landlords in east of England, I ended up with about 40, 50 pages of notes before I even started writing anything. So that's, that's sort of the first lesson, I guess, of, of uh, doing these things. Um, so I'll start with sort of how we did it and then I'll go on to, to things we learned, to, you know, some of the do's and don'ts. Um, now, this wasn't something I'd long planned to do. Um, you know, it didn't sort of take me months and months of thinking about it. I just came across a post on Facebook um, and I thought, we, we need to find out more about this. Um, the post, which has since been deleted, otherwise I would be showing it to you, um, was from one of our local MPs in Norwich, a guy called Clive Lewis. Um, he had visited a charity, Shelter, I'm sure most of you have heard of Shelter, um, and they had given him photos, like really disgusting photos, of the inside of some homes. Um, I've got one of them, um, so that one in the middle here, um, that door, um, with that kind of film over it, that white door, um, that's one of them. Um, and that obviously, you know, got me interested, got me thinking, how, how can anyone live in these conditions? Um, particularly when a lot of the people living in these conditions are put there by councils, you know, it's public money is going to some really dodgy people to house people because there's nowhere else to put them. Um, so I spoke to Clive, um, he just said, you have to go and see Shelter. So I went to see Shelter and they said, Clive wasn't actually meant to put any of these photos out, we we're really sorry. Um, but I had a long conversation with them um, just to get an idea of some of the issues that people were facing. Um, and I guess there's something else I learned along the way is don't go in um, with your mind made up about what you think you're going to find and what you think your end story is going to be. You've got to go in with like, a really open mind at the start. Speak to all the experts, you know. You're normally not the expert. Um, speak to as many people as you can before you start deciding on areas you, you want to go into. Um, so I had a couple of meetings with Shelter um, and they started giving me stuff off record, you know, just places to look, you know, places to go to to, to find out more information. Um, so that was like the background info. That, that was off record. We didn't have a quote. It, it, was, it was just a bit of guidance. But it did help me formulate an FOI, which I'm going to um, just show you here. This was an FOI I formed um, to put into every council um, in Norfolk and Suffolk. But basically what I was trying to do here uh, was to show the extent of a problem and then show the lack of action taken to resolve that problem, because that was what Shelter was telling me. Um, something I've learned as a, the more I've done this job is to take a long time over your FOIs. You know, at the start, I was just firing off these things, asking a couple of questions, and getting back really inadequate uh, responses, which just weren't doing a job for me. This one, I've, I spent a lot more time over, really kind of carefully formu formulating the questions. And it does obviously go against your instinct as a journalist to write category one hazard on the housing health and safety rating systems but you've, you've got to just speak in the language of the council because that helps them find what you're after um, you, you, you've got to talk to them in, in, in their own language um, so that was sent off to all councils um, so that was the data side of it which we were slowly getting back um, but the next obvious thing we needed was, was the human side of it we needed people's stories um, I don't know if anyone was in Paul Bradshaw's session earlier about putting the, the human face on data. Um, but that's the key to something like housing. How, housing is a social issue, it's a people issue. It's not, for me, a data-driven issue. Um, so to do that, um, obviously you've got an advantage work for, for a local regional paper. You can simply put an, an, an appeal out and people in your area are going to see that. Um, so we put appeals on our website, on Facebook, in the paper, and we got loads of people coming back, which, which is always great. Um, a lot of them didn't come to anything because, um, you know, talking out about how rubbish the places you're living in and pissing off your landlord, there's the fear that you're going to end up homeless. Um, and, you know, having a crap house is, you know, normally better than having no house. So there was a lot of reluctance um, to, to talk about it. But we did get some people on record. Um, I went to see about 10 or 11 different houses um, and we visited every one. Another thing there, like I, I wouldn't be comfortable writing about the condition of a place which I haven't seen. Um, you know, a lot of people sent us photos of sort of mouldy bathrooms or weird shapes around their bathroom tiles. That doesn't say to me, um, this is a rogue landlord. That says, you know, your bathroom's not clean. Um, so do go there yourself, get an extent of how bad things are. Um, 
And that's what I did. We went to see um, several different tenants. Um, and you can see some of them up there. Um, the lady in the top right-hand corner, um, she was one of those tenants who'd been kicked out for complaining about her housing conditions. Um, she'd ended up living in a caravan with her three children. Um, she's still living in one now. Uh, well, she was still living in one in February when I saw her, so over a year later, um, after complaining to her landlord. Um, the family down here, they got rehoused after our story, but they were in four kids in really horrible, mouldy place. And then you can see, hopefully, um, some of the photos of the conditions in other places. And that, you know, really brings it home, um, those photos. After we sort of, you know, given examples of some of the issues, the next obvious step is to start looking at, at the landlords themselves. Um, you know, you, you, you've shown the problem, you've shown what all these issues are. How do you then, you know, end up with something like this on the right? I was very proud of this front page. That guy I pictured is Nick, he's called Nick Sutton. Um, he's a millionaire property developer. He's married to a Turkish princess. His mansion was rented by Adele. Um, and he also happens to own this block of flats in Norwich, which is so bad that the council, for the first time in their history, ordered everyone out of the flats because it was so unsafe. Um, it was absolutely disgusting in there. And it's not just sort of obviously physically disgusting to your eyes, but there's things you can't see, um, such as, you know, dangerous electrics or risk of fire and things like that. Um, and that came across because I built up a relationship with the local council who gave me their um, inspection notices and, and safety briefings of, of the block of flats. So I'm just going to move on to uh, some of the, the lessons very quickly. Um, so on, on, the, on that landlord point, um, you know, there's obvious sources to use to find out who owns the place. You've got land registry. But a lot of these places are owned by companies, and the guy behind it is a few steps removed um, from it. Uh, thankfully, in this case, the block of flats we were looking at was owned by a company. He was a director of that company, and his wife was the sole shareholder of the firm. So it was, it was an easy enough link to make. Um, I then also Googled him. We found out he'd been on BBC Watchdog um, for not returning deposits to tenants. Um, he'd also had previous firms which went bust, owing millions of pounds. Um, we got county court judgments on him, showing that his company owned hundreds of thousands of pounds to tradesmen. Like, you know, the more you dug, the more you found. Um, so do really go into as much detail as you can of the people behind the properties. Um, and follow up and up and up. Um, you know, the, the, the initial stories can lead to loads more stories. So this is hopefully here. I've, I started writing about this one guy in 2017. And out of that, you know, we've had about two years worth of stories just about his one block of flats. Um, and just a couple of other final things. If you can, get the council on side. You don't necessarily need them to do your story, but it does really help having a local council who want to look like they're taking action. Um, so they invite me in to do sort of interviews with the housing officer. We had off-record briefings about this place. Out of my stories, they went and, and inspected it and, and shut it down. Uh, there was another council which didn't help at all. Um, they felt it was a negative story about them placing vulnerable people in bad conditions, so they, they didn't want to engage whatsoever, um, which, you know, that's, that's their shout, but it doesn't help. Um, so try and get the council on side if you can. Um, I've said about going out and visiting as many places as you can. Um, do look at solutions. Um, I don't think it's enough anymore, as Maeve will no doubt um, go into much more detail on. It's not enough anymore just to say this is a problem, look how bad this is. Um, I think, you know, investigative journalism should be offering solutions to, to the problems that you're identifying. Um, and do tread carefully. You're on very legally contentious ground with some of these landlords. They might say, it was an agent managing it. I had absolutely nothing to do with it. You know, how dare you put a photo of me and my kids and my house on, on the front of your paper. Um, and then very finally, some of the people living in these conditions, they're not necessarily living there just because there's a bad landlord. A lot of them will be very vulnerable themselves. Um, they may well have a lot of mental health or, or addiction issues. Um, there's one woman I visited who, it was probably the worst house we saw. But I didn't use her in the story because she had serious issues. She was a hoarder. Um, you couldn't, I mean, you could just about step in the door. And after that, sort of ceiling to floor was just piled with old newspapers and things like that. And I just felt that she didn't really know what I was about and what we were trying to do. And it wouldn't really be fair to, uh, you know, do all this stuff about her. Um, so, yes, that was, uh, that was our work. Thank you.
Hi guys, um, my name is Lois, as I said before, and I um, work for this newspaper, Dublin Inquirer. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're just to recap, we're a very small independent local newspaper in Dublin and we're reader supported uh, rather than advertising supported and we've been going about four years. Um, and as you can see, we kind of do a lot of housing and homelessness coverage, affordable housing crisis. Um, I guess because we're small, we kind of try to keep focused on some key areas and housing because it's so critical to having an inclusive city and also so critical to growing inequality is one of the areas that we kind of focus on. Um, so I was going to talk through two basically things broadly that have come up during like the last couple of years, I guess, in, in the housing and the homelessness reporting. Um, and one, it kind of recaps with what Tom says, which is about kind of opacity over property ownership and what that means for tenants, uh, what that can mean for us as reporters. This is the inside of a flat in um, South Richmond Street, which is in the south inner city in Dublin. It's kind of like in an old Georgian terrace, and it's um, one of these apartment buildings blocks that kind of a couple of a few of the flats have people in them gradually it's slightly kind of be detenanted um, and it, you might be able to see here this is actually to the bathroom um, that's got a curtain up now and nothing at the top and you can kind of see the front door here and basically a few days before I took this photo um, some people had come in and they'd left with the doors um, and there's video of it and and you know everything and it, um, uh, the backstory is that the guys here had been, um, the, the notices to quit had come to the apartment. Um, the guys living there had said, uh, we don't think these are valid. Um, th the name on it wasn't their name and they didn't think it applied for them. Now, if, if they, uh, it's then there's a process to go through, right? You go to this board called the Residential Tenancies Board and, and the landlord would file a kind of dispute um, and then uh, th they'd rule and there'd be appeal and then it maybe it would go to court, like, you know, all that, that kind of process. Anyway, that, that didn't happen and um, instead the, the doors walked away um, and you, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> um, so I wrote a, a story about this, this was like a month or so ago, so we do quite a lot about evictions. Um, one of the issues that came up in this story and that's come up in past stories has been uh, tenants not feeling like they actually know who their landlord is. So a little bit before they got their notices to quit in this apartment, um, the, the building had been sold. Um, so they were dealing with a property manager, but they didn't know who was behind that. And it made them feel, they said, very kind of faceless. The landlord before used to come in and clean the common areas. They'd have a chat about what was go how, what, how things were going, how it wasn't going. And then it had been sold to a fund, and they had no idea basically how to reach the people who were actually the beneficial, the top beneficial owners in a way. Um, and there's a, so since a few years ago, Technically, if a property is sold, you have to register it with the Property Registration Authority in Ireland. A lot of the city still isn't registered with the Property Registration Authority, so you can go online and you can find some of it. Um, but there's also a massive backlog. So even if things have been sold in like the last six months or so, you won't necessarily get it from the online database. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of parallel registry, which is called the Registry of Deeds, which you can go to, which you can search if you know the previous owner or a previous owner in the past, however long, and trace it forward potentially. Um, so you can do that by going to planning records or um, uh, some uh, old leases for people who've lived in their neighbours. Uh, sometimes there are kind of vacant sites, registers, old press mentions, like all the kind of different sources you can possibly think of to go. Luckily in this case these guys had their old landlord's name um, so I could go and use that and go to the, go to the land registry and find the, the current owner which it was a company um, that is linked when you go up to Bain Capital, the big um, US-based um, investment fund people. Um, so again, like that, that uh, from the, the tenants kind of said that they didn't really feel that helped them understand who still was their landlord in a way. It's still a faceless entity um, and they're still actually re refusing to, to leave and that's, that's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, so property ownership is one, Sadra, I'll come back to this thing actually. Um, the other thing that we kind of try to do is obviously like we all do as journalists is fill in gaps in information. Um, so I'll ignore that one because I was, I don't have time, but this, um, so if, when you talk to people who are homeless in Dublin, one of the first things that people will complain about is the 
homeless hostel system and the free phone, uh, which for some people, they, if they're individuals, you have to still call up every night to get a bed for that night. Um, and sometimes you'll call, let's say, 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock and you won't know until then if you're going to get a bed in a hostel and then you get kicked out in the morning and you have to do it all again. And it's like this tyranny of bureaucracy that um, becomes a whole full-time job if you're homeless and that's why a lot of people say they check out completely of government systems because it's just like on top of everything and already chaotic life and often, you know, you know, poverty and trying to, or mental health problems, or, or, or you're going to get them <laughs> once you're stuck in the system for a while. We're staying in a hostel here while we're here, and last night I just couldn't sleep at all. So, like, being stuck in this kind of thing. Um, anyway, uh, so, but the funny thing is, no one was complaining about it. <laughs> like, for an FOIs, for complaints, for going years back, no one was, was filing. And obviously, again, there's a power imbalance. People don't want to uh, complain, they don't feel they can, um, and they didn't feel they're having a voice. So we thought, after doing a, kind of a few stories about this kind of thing, we decided that we'd actually commission a survey. Now, um, it might seem a little bit of a cop-out to pay somebody else to do a survey, <laughs> um, but the thing is we're quite small and we're still quite new, and we thought we could maybe piggyback off the legitimacy of a market research company that, um, say, the government has used for things. So if, say, Ampost, the post office service has used it, or a government department has used it, it'll be harder for them to say it wouldn't work. The problem, too, is that we're really small. We don't have loads of money to pay for it. So we crowdfunded this. So we went to our readers and we said, look, this is a thing that's coming up time and time again. There is no like comprehensive uh, survey asking people what their experiences are, what they would like to fix about it, what they would like policy to focus on. Um, so we'd like to plug this gap. So uh, we managed to raise the money, which was great, from loads of different people uh, and loads of different amounts. Some people gave a couple of hundred, some people gave 10 euro. It was really broad based. And then as part of that also, we've got readers who are, have been homeless, readers who are homeless, readers who work in homeless services, and readers who uh, work in kind of social science designing surveys. So I kind of talked to all of those people to get input into what questions the survey should be and determined what the, what the survey should be, how to and also talk to them at best how, about, how best to go about it in a way like how do we explain to people what they're doing, make sure we have consent, make sure they understand, and also then, again, make sure we go back to them with the answers and what we've got so that then they've got copies of it that they can use in whatever they, way they want to advocate for themselves as well. Um, and also with responses from Dublin Region Homeless Executive, which manages this, and uh, hostel providers and all this kind of thing. So this is an example of some of the stuff that we got. 88% said they'd seen violence, 61% said they'd experienced violence, 89% by the intimidation, 60% experienced it. We had a section, this is a cutout, so we, got, uh, we have a cartoonist who helps us out, so we did a cartoon narrative of the findings. Um, and that's kind of some of what people said as well. And now we know this is kind of used by some homeless charities to train volunteers, uh, we know that the council has it um, for some research they're doing now on how this operates, this whole system, uh, that I, maybe they do anyway, but you know, we'll take credit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and, oh, and, and then we also gave it back, obviously, to, yeah, as I said, the places that we set up to interview people so that they have that. Um, I just, one thing I was going to go back to, um, I guess, yeah, I guess, um, one of the things like Tom talks about is this kind of idea of trying to do a journalism that isn't extractive, that we're not just dropping in and then taking the story and then running away and leaving people who are going through a really traumatic situation like losing their homes or um, with mental health problems and just sort of checking out. And I guess the good thing about being a local newspaper is that we are kind of around and they can find us again. Doing solutions, I think, is a good way to do that as well and focusing on solutions because a lot of people want you to do that. Um, so this is an image from a, a longer profile I did of a tenants' rights activist who um, was kind of filling a hole in tenants not knowing how to advocate for themselves. So he basically started off his own back. He had problems with his landlord and took them to this board and then he started doing hundreds and hundreds of cases for people um, while also dealing with his own, his own um, challenges and uh, so I spent a, a lot of time with him and, and wrote a profile of him and also of course in that case talked to the landlord and was very upfront with him at the beginning, here's who I'm going to talk to and here's how it's going to be and, um, and but still, still it feels shitty sometimes <laughs> like uh, when, when people are going through a really, really, really hard time. 
Um, and I don't know what the solution to that is. So <laughs> um, if anybody has any ideas. Then. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Great. So um, <laughs> I thought that wasn't going to appear then. Uh, so I work uh, at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism um, as part of their Bureau local team. Um, which is an amazingly uh, privileged position for me to be in. We work with a network of journalists and civic tech people all across the country. I think we're more than 1,060 people so far. Straw poll, is anyone in the room part of our network? Yeah, I like the pride with which you raise that. And everyone else should be because it's open to absolutely everyone. Um, what we do is we try and work all together collaboratively on an investigation, kind of in the model of the ICIJ and Panama Papers, the idea that there's enough stories out there that we can be bigger than the sum of our parts if we come together and help each other out um, finding the stories and presenting the stories. And so I'm going to talk about this project we did called Dying Homeless, um, which started back in January 18 with a pretty simple question, I thought, or so I thought. I saw a couple of stories like this um, that were in the national press about people who had died while homeless. Uh, in particular, there was a man who died a couple of meters away from the Houses of Parliament. And that just got me thinking, you know, if we know that more people are experiencing homelessness because the data, the government data shows that shot up, and if we know more people are sleeping rough because similarly the government data is shot up, is there an equivalent increase in people dying homeless? And what I thought was a simple question led me down uh, several rabbit holes and many weeks of phoning different people to try and find out uh, who would hold that data. So I phoned coroner's offices and they said, we don't hold data on homeless deaths, but I'm sure the police will. I phoned the police and they said, no, not us, but maybe the uh, council will. The council said no, but tried the hospitals. The hospital said no, but tried a coroner. And I went round and round until we came to the conclusion that nobody holds this data. Um, there is no centralized figure on that. And at that point, we realized then there's kind of a moral imperative uh, for us as journalists to, to try and address that void um, in the evidence. Um, but how to do that was another question. So I then took quite a lot of time coming up with a methodology. And the very first point was, was kind of simple, but it was what do we consider homeless to be? Um, and I thought, I'm not qualified to, to come to that conclusion. But luckily, there was plenty of reports and experts um, that had already looked into that. So we took uh, a definition from Crisis, who are one of the major homelessness charities, um, uh, which was homelessness including people rough sleeping, people in emergency accommodation like shelters, people sleeping in cars and in tents, and people that are sofa surfing. So we had that as our parameter. Okay, we'll use that as homelessness. Then um, I realized that what I had, which many other people wouldn't have, was this incredible network of journalists all around the country that we could reach out to. If there is no centralized data on this, maybe there is more kind of localized data that we could pull together. So I created a, a, a really simple Google form that kind of allowed us to input some data on, you know, do you know somebody who might have died while homeless? Can you give us some information if you know their name, if you know the date when it happened, maybe you know the age they were, um, maybe you can give us pointers towards people that might have been working with them so we could verify that. And we sent that out um, far and wide, both across our network, and then I also um, got my fantastic colleague Charles to, to scrape this registry of homelessness services that exists on a place called Homeless Link. They had a long list of all of the shelters and day centers that existed to provide homeless services in the UK. So we scraped that list and I sent it to all of them as well, this kind of block email. Um, and didn't get a huge amount of response, to be quite honest, at the start. It took a long time of this process to garner trust with people who were working with people on the ground who were experiencing homelessness. And rightly so. They all thought, you know, we don't know you from Adam. You could be writing some scandalized, sensationalist story about people that they really cared about. Um, and I needed to build that trust with people. And by the end of this project, which took a little over a year now, we had people kind of forthcoming, presenting us with information in a way that, that took a long time for them to warm up to. So I did that, put the call out. 
I also just started searching through Google and creating my own database. I'd actually been doing this over the Christmas holidays because that's the kind of person I am. While other people were watching Gone with the Wind and whatever, I was uh, Googling homeless, deaf, and dying homeless, and had come up with this list of 40 or so people already, which is what I took to my editors as a kind of uh, proof of concept. And so continued that, doing more and more kind of variations of Google searches. Because what we found were often these deaths, particularly deaths of people who were sleeping rough, weren't reported nationally. The sterling work of local journalists had been reporting them. So part of that was just a collation of the information that was already out there in the public domain to pull together. Uh, despite what everyone had told me about them not holding the data, I thought I'll chance my luck and do FOIs just in case the press officers were being more cagey than the, the, the other data bods. But it turned out most of them absolutely weren't uh, holding the data. A couple of the Scottish councils were. So that was a really positive way to actually just, just to kind of try every angle to pull in some of that information. And then I worked hard um, ingratiating myself with the charity that controls um, data uh, around rough sleeping in London particularly. Because there is a network here where people who are sleeping rough are kind of recorded on this centralized database because people move across boroughs in London so often. Um, and after a fair amount of persuasion, they were able to pull out some of the data for me as well. So it was really a jigsawing together. Um, and I realized quite early on that we were going to have to launch this and publish this early to, to get people involved and on board. It wasn't going to be a case of me doing this for a year and then coming up with a figure. It was actually going to be super helpful to be able to show our working and show our intentions. Um, so we launched this uh, in April 2017? 2018. 2018. Um, and uh, we created this visualization because we were really clear that we didn't just want this to be a statistical data story. It was about human lives. And we needed to report that in a dignified and respectful way. So we wrote where we could little blurbs about each person that we'd found who had died, trying to give a sense of, of who they were, what their hopes were, um, what kind of situation they were in. Um, and we published that. And at that point, we were also able to put out this story that from just that preliminary search, we'd found that there was two people every week that were, um, sleeping, that were dying while, while sleeping on the streets across the UK. And we continued this for a year. We worked with our local network, who were incredible at uh, digging into what was happening in their local patch. Uh, they fed inf information. I traveled far and wide across the country trying to um, you know, talk to people face to face, try to, to create a relationship by which they would, they would present me with information. I found loads of GPs um, holding lists of people that had died, often feeling that if they hadn't written down the names, Nobody else would, and they were able to hand over some of that. Talking to people working in shelters and in day centers and soup kitchens. Um, you know, you'll all have found it when, you, when you're doing these kind of stories, but one person leading you on to the next person leading you on to the next. And as soon as you have that kind of vouching from someone else, it's a lot easier than the cold calling element. And after a year, we were able to, to do, run some analysis on the data that we had, which we were constantly updating. But we found this, that there was you know, almost 800 people had died in that year period. And we were clear from the start that that was a huge underestimate. These were only people that we were seeing. Um, and you know, we tried where we could to tell stories of each of those. 22% of them were women, that the average age uh, when they were dying was tragically low, uh, decades and decades below the kind of national average um, or life expectancy. We were able to do a little bit of analysis on the kind of things that people were dying from, um, a bit of analysis on where they were when they, were, when they died. So we, I tried to code for if people were physically on the streets, if they were in shelters, if they were in hospital, to get a sense of, of where this was happening. And we got a sense of the kind of issues that they'd been facing um, while they were alive. Things like being uh, no recourse to public funds because their immigration status meant that they couldn't access um, homelessness services, uh, or family breakdowns being a kind of uh, recurrent theme, mental health issues being a recurrent theme. Uh, these were just some of the stories. You know, we found, I think, quite quickly, we found that what we had perceived to be the face of homelessness was actually much more complex. It was people who had. 
Um, you know, there was a guy who at one point had been up for a job with Stephen Hawkins. He was a quantum physicist, a super intelligent guy, a refugee from Iran. There was this grandmother, of, you know, who had several kids. There were all kinds of people, not, not the kind of stereotypical image that we might all consider, um, or just one size fits all homelessness. So we tried to tell some of those stories as well. And then, as Tom said, we were quite keen that we come at it as well from a kind of solution-based angle. Uh, obviously, the solution, well, not obviously, what I, what I think now after having researched this for a year and a half is probably the solution to homelessness is reverse a decade worth of austerity cuts and rebuild the social security network. Um, but in terms of what we thought we would call for, what we thought the impact we can make with our journalism, one of, it, what, one of those uh, impacts was the fact that there was a mechanism to investigate when people were dying homeless and to try and find out where the services might have not connected up, where people might have fallen through the cracks and where we could prevent deaths like that happening again. And it was called a safeguarding adult review, which is where you get kind of lots of people in the council and police and doctors all in one room and they talk about the, the case and they kind of work out what went wrong or, or what they could do better. Um, Homeless Link, who kind of do a lot of the work on this, had said that should be the kind of that should be what happens when there's a, a, a death of somebody who's sleeping rough. But we realised we we I uh, put in freedom of information requests to the sample group that we had at that point to 83 of those deaths to ask in each case has there been a review, and there wasn't. And we also asked has there ever been a review into homelessness deaths, and there's been one on average one a year. So that gave us a real clear call to action when we put out some of those stories that we could say, this is happening, nobody counts it, we're the only ones counting, and despite the fact that there is this mechanism to investigate this, nobody is doing that, and maybe perhaps they should do. Um, and we started out with this, uh, with our hashtag, which was make them count, which was, you know, obviously these deaths should count for something, we should learn lessons from them, but also it shouldn't take a journalistic unit of a couple of people and a network of local journalists to do this, there should be official data on this. So quite early on in the session, we started in, in, in the project, we started working with the Office for National Statistics and we opened up our database to them so that they could develop a methodology to see if there was stuff that they could do to come up with official statistics. They have access to all of the death certificates and the death records, which is something I couldn't get as a journalist. But what they could do was using our database, they could test in the death certificates to see if there were patterns there on the death records themselves that they could use to kind of extrapolate um, estimates on figures on, on homeless deaths, um, which they did and they produced that for the first time in December last year. Um, and what they could do was, was run that same algorithm through previous years and they could see through that that there'd been this huge rise, a 24% increase over the last five years in, in, homeless, in deaths of people experiencing homelessness. So it took all of that to get to what I thought was that easy question back in January the year before. If that, that was the figure I got. It just took a, lo a long way round to get there. And because we have this fantastic network, they all publish stories specific to their region as well. So they could say in the context of what the Bureau found, almost 800 deaths across the, the year and a half we were doing it, here's what we found in Northern Ireland, in Yorkshire, in Kent, in Brighton, wherever it might be. And that was super important because then that meant that those local councils all got rung up and got asked questions. And now there's those kind of reviews that I was talking about are happening in councils across the country now because people are held to account in a way that perhaps they wouldn't have if they'd just seen our Channel 4 news story. So it's the power of this kind of collective network is immense when we can harness it for good. And I have no idea how long it took, but I whizzed through that. But just to say, I am now pivoting in this work to, to look at homelessness and housing and the intersection of that, because obviously there's a, there's a huge gap there in that we know there just aren't enough homes and affordable homes to go around. So we put a call out to our network, and if you're in a network, please tell me or fill in our form, and if you're not, then please join the network and tell me. But we want to hear from, from folks across the country about what we should be looking at next in this area. What are the things that are happening here and here and here and here that nobody has yet put together in that same way that we did with homeless deaths? So join our network here, tbij.com. For some reason it says explainers, but then join our network. Um, let me know. You can tweet at me. Um, or we have this survey going around on our Bureau local Twitter. 
um, about housing issues in the future, but I would love you to get involved. And then hopefully this time next year, we can talk about the great work we've all done together <laughs> to, to come to the next tragic conclusion <laughs> about the state of our country. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>